my name is Tom Drummy. Uh, I came to UNB in 1948, took a degree in arts, and then a couple of years later took a degree in law, and uh, was awarded a Lord Beaverbrook Overseas Scholarship in 1954. Went to England in 1954. Uh, could have stayed for two years, but I only stayed for one because I uh, did more funning around than studying. Uh, <clears throat> in those days, you didn't fly to England. You went on a boat, so we went on a boat to Liverpool and uh, took a train in from Liverpool to London and were met by his lordship's uh, banker who... Uh, gave us some instructions and some money and sent us on our way. And one of the things was an invitation to a uh, sherry party at Lord Beaverbrook's apartment on Green Park and uh, a couple of days later. So uh, a few of us friends went down to, to the apartment and knocked on the door. When the door opened, uh, Jock the butler who was uh, a, a small man, he wasn't tall. And uh, as soon as he heard who I was, he said, oh, come with me right away. And he grabbed me by the arm and ran me through this living room that had about 30 people in it, about half students and half his business associates. And Jock shoved me behind a big curtain and there were a couple of windows in the uh, room and they were alcoves, and this curtain covered one of the alcoves. And Lord Beaverbrook was standing there with nothing but a lectern in front of him. So he, he greeted me and said, how are you, and, and uh, that sort of thing. And we had met before. So uh, he said, look, he said, the reason uh, you're in here with me is that People expect people like me to remember names and faces. And he said it's a very important um, trait to, to uh, remember names and faces. How he said, like, for, he said, for example, Casey Irving never forgets the name to go with a face. He said he's just got a marvelous talent for it. He said I haven't, but I can afford to appear to be. And he said, and he pulled out these little pieces of paper that were sitting on the lectern. He said, each one of these sheets of paper has a short biography of each of the students who are here. So he said, your job is to peek through the curtain, find out who is in a group, give me the names, and I'll quickly look at these things, and then we'll go out, and you stay close to me. So I looked through the curtain and I said, well, the first thing I can tell you is that I don't know half of them because they were here a year ahead of me. Uh, well, he says, then we'll just have to wing them, but let's, you know, give me the names of who were there. So I gave him half a dozen names. He, he obviously had studied these pieces of paper, so he sort of whistled through them and took out the ones I gave him the names of, glanced at them and said, okay, let's go. <clears throat> so out we went to the first group that were sort of standing talking to each other. And I walked up and I said, uh, Your Lordship, this is, oh, he says, I know, that's John Smith or some name like that. Uh, is your father still running that grocery store in Moncton? And uh, so the, you could see the pleased expression that that evoked. And, uh, and we went around the next half dozen or so uh, with the same kind of performance. Uh, a couple of times there was somebody I didn't know, and I said, oh, I'm Tom Drummy, and you know, they immediately gave me their name, and, and he took it from there. Then we went back behind the curtain and went through a few more, and uh, we did that until he had spoken to everybody and uh, certainly made them all feel good that he had remembered them. And so then he uh, grabbed me by the arm and he said, would you like a drink? I said, sure. So he took me over to the bar where Jock was now, instead of butling, he was bartending. And this was supposed to be a sherry party. 
So he said, uh, would you like scotch? And I said, sure. So he said to Jock, bring in a bottle of my best single malt scotch. The special one, he said. So Jock said, yes, my lord, brought it out and poured me a drink. And then, then he took me by the elbow over and, and introduced me to his granddaughter, Lady Jean Campbell. She was drinking milk for some reason or other, I remember that. <clears throat> but I also have met her since then and realized that that wasn't uh, her usual beverage. But anyway, so we, we had a chat and he sort of went over against the wall watching everybody in the room. Well, where Lady Jean was were mostly what we thought at the time were elderly gentlemen. You know, they were all Sir This or Lord That. I think some of the higher ups in the newspaper, that sort of thing. So they started drifting over towards the bar, and uh, I was close enough that I could hear what they were saying. They were saying they'd like a glass of scotch, and Jock would say, uh, "Yes, my lord, another sherry." <laughs> and and uh, the guy said, "You know." Scotch and and uh, well, he said another sherry, my lord, or whoever it was, and of course, Beaverbrook is over against the wall, giggling. <laughs> so, I finished my drink pretty quick and went back and oh, Mr. Drummer, yeah, and he poured me another one and back I went into the room and and he was getting a great boot out of all these guys being um, turned down. So. Uh, Anyway, then we went back behind the curtain, and he said uh, <clears throat> he knew one of my classmates, uh, an attractive young lady, and he said, uh, I remember the last time that I'd met him, he'd, he'd monopolized her conversation, and elbow, uh, elbow, elbowed me out of the way. So uh, he said, where's she now? And I said, well, as a matter of fact, She's across the street in the Mayfair Hotel. I think that was the name of the place. Uh, her father had sent her on a trip to Europe. Oh, well, he said, yeah, you should, I, if I'd known, I'd have had her here. But he said, why don't you bring her out to my house in the country this Saturday, and we'll have lunch. Well, I said, sure. So he said, well, you, you come down here on Thursday, and Jock will give you training tickets and instructions, which he did. And uh, and we went out to Cherkley and we were met at the front door by Lord Beaverbrook uh, and the valet opened the door to the car. It was his car that brought us in from the station. And uh, it was Lord Beaverbrook's car, big fancy one. So his lordship welcomed us and took us inside and uh, we went I, I forget now whether we had lunch first or whether we had a tour first, but uh, the, the tour was more interesting. So he said, would you like to see around the place? So we, we went around. It had five living rooms. And uh, one of them, the biggest one, had a painting of the scene you see looking out the window, sitting on an easel. And uh, that painting is now in the gallery here. It was was painted by Winston Churchill, and Lord Beaverbrook said he painted it sitting right there in that chair with that easel. So that was sort of interesting. And uh, I also noticed that as we went around the house, almost every nook and cranny, he'd reach in and pull out a dictaphone, just a, like a little microphone, and he would say something, you know, give instructions to somebody or other somewhere put it back, and that he did that all the time, every room we went into. So uh, we ended up in the smallest living room, and his son came in, just like out of the movies, he was wearing a tennis sweater. And uh, so Lord Beaverbrook introduced him, this was Sir Max, and uh, he said he's, uh, he's building a house up on the hill, he's, he just got engaged to be married again. He said, which is great, he said, because it gives me a chance to make another settlement. He said, I, I love settlements. Now, he, he knew that we were both lawyers and understood some of the language he was going, but he said, I, I like them because it, 
saves taxes, which is, which is the best reason. And he said it also, he said, none of my descendants are ever going to have a claim on my estate. I'm deciding what they need from me now. And uh, they, will, they will be well looked after, but they will have no claim on my estate, which I now, looking back, think, gee, that's sort of interesting seeing as what's happened around here about the gallery, but of course this, we're, I'm talking uh, around the 1st of October 1954, so uh, there was lots of life left in him at that time and he could have changed his mind. I rather doubt it, but uh, anyway, that was that story. Uh, so he, we then, we went out at some point uh, and had lunch outside and uh, he had a friend with him who was, I, I remember she was the daughter of the president of Credit Foncier. It might have been Credit Lisse, it was one of the big French banks. And she looked like Coco Chanel, very thin, small woman. And the uh, four of us had lunch. Uh, she had a big dog with her and he fed it, you know, put the dog dish down and everything. Very natural man. He, he was always very pleasant and kept the conversation going. <clears throat> now that's, that's the first story. The second story I have is that uh, a number of us lived in a residence called London House, which was a, a residence for Commonwealth students. We were sitting around talking because the fellows who had been there ahead of us the previous year told us about how on his 75th birthday, which would have been May the 25th, 1954, three months before we got there, that he had invited them to his 75th birthday party and it was really quite a bash. It was in one of the best hotels in London. I forget the name of it, but it's right next to the American Embassy. And uh, so they had a wonderful time at this party. So we said, well, you know, we, we should make sure we get entertained on his 76th birthday. And uh, so I come up with the bright idea that why don't we invite him to have dinner with us on his birthday. And of course he'll, he'll reciprocate and say, oh no, you know, you can go out with me. So I, I don't recall whether I called or wrote. I probably wrote and got a phone call back. But the secretary said, uh, his lordship says he will be delighted to accept your invitation. And I said, fine. Um, she said he can't make it on the 25th of May, but, you know, three or four days later would be more convenient. So uh, I said, fine, great. So I went back to my group and advised them what they were facing a bit of a, an expenditure that they might not have been uh, looking forward to. But the, everybody thought that was great. And the people that ran London House uh, was, uh, well, I'm trying to think. Uh, the head guy was a retired general. The fellow that ran the place was a retired colonel. And it was that ty type of place. And they told me they'd been trying to get Beaverbrook there for 20 years to look around, but you know, they'd never been successful. So I could do no wrong after that. I, I'd gone and asked for, for them to put it on for us, which, which they did. So uh, he, uh, he came to the, to the residence. And it was a pretty nice residence by our standards even today. It, it, it had a nice room to have cocktails in, a private dining room that we we had the dinner in. So uh, he arrived and he wouldn't come in unless I came out and took him in. Well, of course, <clears throat> we'd all been drinking all afternoon getting ready for this deal. And uh, so I I went out and, uh, and helped him out of the car, which I now think is funny because he was five years younger than I am. <laughs> but anyway, I had to, to uh, help him out of the car and, and uh, he took my arm and we walked in and uh, 
He said, now remember, it's the same deal. You stay close to me and uh, if, help me out if I don't remember some of the names. Well, I said, sure. And so we just went through like a receiving line. He, everybody was sort of lined up and we walked along. And, and I, I would try to mumble the name as soon as I figured it out. And then, well, by that time, I knew them all anyway. And uh, so that went through great. We got to the end of the line. So the, the butler, who uh, this, this is our butler at, at uh, London House, who was all spiffed up in white tie and tails, said, uh, do you suppose his lordship would like a drink of something? And, uh, and Lord Beaverbrook said, well, Yes, as a matter of fact, he said, I don't want anything right now, but I'd like to have a bottle of scotch at the table where, where I'm going to be sitting and a couple of glasses of water to go with it. So uh, he said, fine, and I just nodded to the guy, and, and the party continued, and, and at some point uh, he came back and announced that dinner was ready, and we all went in and sat down. So there were probably... I would say 15 to 20 of us, I don't know how, quite how many, but all the overseas scholars who were there at that time attended and chipped in to pay for it too. Um, but I, Lord Beaver sort of acted as though I was his host. I, he grabbed me by the arm and I had to sit next to him. So I'm sitting there and he says, would, would you, do you like scotch? Would you like a drink? And I said, sure. He poured a whole glass full of scotch into my glass. I was so busy laughing at everybody else who didn't have a drink that I, I thought to myself, well, if he can drink it, I guess I can. So I drank this glass of scotch and laughing at all my friends who had nothing. And uh, as I got towards the end of the glass, the butler came along and said, you suppose his lordship might want some soda water or he, and I looked he hadn't taken a drop and and he said yes I would but he said I wanted half and half water and scotch and then I want another full glass of water so he he drank a glass of water and a glass of one and one and uh handled it fine. I had reached the stage where I don't think I could have stood up if I had to. And uh, so I had somebody uh, primed to make a speech of welcome. It was actually Bill Crawford, who later became the president of Mount A. And he made a great speech. And, and, and uh, so, uh, so I'm sat, sitting back feeling very happy. And the beaver then said, well, would you like me to respond? Well, I said, sure. And I tried to get up and really couldn't, but I sort of waved my hand and he stood up, gave a marvelous speech. He could speak as well as Winston Churchill. It was really great. I, I don't recall what the uh, topic was, but it was, it was interesting. And uh, so when it all broke up again, he insisted I had to take him back out to the car and help him into the back seat and fit a blanket over his knees. And uh, now, as I say, I'm now older than he was at the time. I can't imagine putting a blanket over my knees, but that's what he did. But he was a, a nice man, a very, very pleasant man. And uh, I always thought those two stories were, were pretty good. Uh, I had met him on other occasions because he knew my uncle. My uncle was the pub publisher of the uh, local newspapers and uh, like the ones in St. John Moncton anyway. So they had business dealings together and they knew each other pretty well. And so <clears throat> my uncle had told me that, that, that he would probably be getting in touch with me and I, I should mind my manners. So uh, I think that explains why he... Um, why well, he asked me to help him out with the names and that sort of thing. I had met him at uh, well, at the law school and, uh, and up here too, because uh, I think in my final year I was vice president of the student council and, and uh, I think one, one of my duties I think was to give him that little beanie hat that 
that he put on. <laughs> and uh, so those are my recollections. That's good. <laughs> That's very good. Um, well, there's anything else on this list that we want. Uh, is there... Is there anything that you um, would want to talk about as far as how having having the scholarship impacted the way your you know path and well it th the basic uh, advantage it was to me I had already you know gone through UNB and had been admitted to the bar so I was already a lawyer. I didn't really, I went to London School of Economics on the scholarship <clears throat> and actually when I went there uh, I was assigned a tutor whose name was Sir David Hughes Perry. He became Sir because he had drawn Lord King George VI's will. Uh, I thought, gee, that's a great way to get a, a knighthood just to draw a will, but anyway, it's one of the simplest things we do. And uh, so I, I had skipped a year of of law school. And, you know, I'd, I'd written exams, but I didn't attend the full three years. I just just went for two. So I thought, well, I'll take a few of the basic courses, and one of them was contracts, which Sir David taught. And I sat through a couple of lectures, and one, and I think in the second lecture, he made some statement, and I stuck my hand up and said, you know. That was overruled by the House of Lords, and uh, so in fact, I remember the case. It was Bell versus Lever. I don't remember what it was about, but <laughs> anyway, uh, he said, "Yeah." He said, "See me after class, and we'll have a discussion." So I went up, and he said, "Look," he said, "the English education system isn't what it's cracked up to be by you know what people think." He said, "Your classmates." Uh, aside from the ones from Africa who hardly have any education, the English ones are just out of high school. They go directly from high school into law school. And, uh, and he said in high school they only take a minimum of two and a maximum of four courses. So he said, you know, they really don't know a heck of a lot. They may sound like they know a lot about those two courses, uh, but uh, you know, you're just wasting your time. He said, go home tonight and read Cheshire and Five Foot on contracts because that's all I'm going to do all year is just read through it. So he said, I'll give you a ticket that will let you go anywhere in the University of London, listen to anything, do whatever. So that was fine by me because actually I had studied economics here at UNB and uh, the uh, uh, Professor Shawcross was pretty well known. He was Lasky's successor. Uh, Lasky was at Harvard that year on loan, so I never did hear anything of his, but I went to Shawcross's lectures and, uh, and I went to some of the other things. I studied a bit of accounting, uh, and, you know, learned a, a few things that I thought might help me, but mostly I enjoyed being there and, and going to the theater and the opera and you name it. And uh, we weren't supposed to leave England. That was one of the rules. So at this dinner that we threw, he said, well, what, what have you done? Well, I said, I, I've been to, uh, I hitchhiked through France and, <laughs> and took a train around Spain, went to a few places there, and then I said, uh, this summer, no. I said, I'm planning on on doing the whole of Europe this summer. And he said, good man. <laughs> he thought that was great that I broke the rule. So, uh, and that's really what I got out of the, uh, out of the scholarship was the opportunity to meet people from all over the world. I, you know, I've, I can call, my, my roommate was from South Africa and I talked to him on the phone just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he's a lawyer in South Africa, and and we 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 met people from all over the world, and got 
got their point of view on things, which generally was pretty much the same as our own point of view. And uh, that's what I got out of the scholarship, was the opportunity to broaden my uh, perspectives. And, um, and I, I don't think that the Beaver had any objection whatsoever to doing that. He knew I didn't really need a lot more education. And, uh, and that's why I only spent one year there. I, I wanted to get to work. I didn't really see what good a Master of Laws degree would do me, and I, I still, after more than 50 years of practice, realize that it would have done me no good. <laughs> so uh, that, that's about it. That's great. <laughs> that was really interesting. <laughs> I like that. Yeah, that was good. Is that thing still taping?